Williams as the Archbishop of Canterbury is the leader of the Global Anglican Communion. The Communion includes 80 million people in 160 countries with diverse histories, beliefs, and cultures. The very word church means assembly called together. It's not an assembly of people who have decided to be with each other and adopt a common agenda, but people who've been brought together by the impact of, in this case, an event, the death and resurrection of Jesus. Rowan Williams says his faith was formed early as a boy growing up in Wales. It was a mining village in the Swansea Valley, about 16 miles from Swansea, and not very prosperous, bilingual, Welsh and English, and very much still in the 1950s, a conservative community socially. Chapel and Sunday school were routine and I think very important to the whole family. And I just got absolutely absorbed by the Bible quite early on as a set of stories and, and then as a set of ideas and then as a set of ideals. After an education at several of England's most prestigious universities, Williams became a parish priest. Being a pastor is actually doing theology in all sorts of contexts, all sorts of modes. You have to relate to people's problems in a language they engage with. And that means you've got to work at your own ideas, your own convictions, in such a way that you can build bridges into other people's experience. And the communication bit is, I think, the pastoral end, where you, you are always seeking for a common language. Williams eventually served as Bishop of Monmouth and then Archbishop of Wales. But every bishop, I think, learns the tasks of trying to, to facilitate a prayerful conversation among people who may not want to spend time together. And during my time as Bishop of Monmouth, we were working through the ordination of women as priests in the Church in Wales, and that was quite hard work. And trying to facilitate a certain depth to that conversation, making sure that people prayed together, starting prayer partnerships in the diocese across the divide of conviction. In 2003, Rowan Williams became the 104th Archbishop of Canterbury. Has the, the experience of being Archbishop of Canterbury been, been different than, than what you expected? I think the two things that have been far, far bigger than I ever expected were, of course, dealing with the tensions and the crises in the communion and all the challenges that come with that, but also the amount of time I find myself spending on interfaith matters. And now that's, that's a major part of the international responsibility. Addressing economics and social justice is both a responsibility and a personal passion. In July 2008, the Archbishop led a march of several hundred bishops through the streets of London to the Houses of Parliament to remind governments of the Millennium Development Goals, which include the eradication of extreme poverty and an end to the deaths of young children from preventable diseases such as malaria. Well, as they say, if they didn't exist, we'd have to invent them. And yet they do represent a serious set of aims for countries that have power, that have leverage in the world. So I'm, I'm clinging to them as priorities and trying to hold our governments to account on them. A lot of words can describe Rowan Williams, scholar, poet, pastor, bishop, political advocate, husband, father. But in the midst of a busy and often complex life, he retained some fundamental beliefs from that boyhood in a small church in Wales. When I was first appointed, I said something about wanting to capture the imagination of the nation again for the church. And yet, of course, when it comes to it, you can't say anything very new, but the truth is what it is, and that's why I ended up saying some you know, rather basic things about faith in Jesus Christ, because what else is there to say? The Most Reverend Rowan Williams is the 104th Archbishop of Canterbury and a keynote speaker at the 2010 Theological Conference of Trinity Institute. We spoke in April 2009 at Lambeth Palace in London. Archbishop Rowan Williams, I want to thank you, first of all, very much for agreeing to join our conference in January on building an ethical economy and for taking this time today to, to look at some of the issues. But I'd like to begin uh, by saying that in doing this, we're clearly moving into the arena of public theology. How do you see the role of public theology today? Public theology is something I define as trying to put to the society around you basic questions about what's human, what's really human, 
what do we expect of human beings? How do we imagine human beings? How do we make human beings flourish? The theologian says, well, I think I can give you a perspective on that. I can give you a perspective in terms of humanity made in the image of God. And when you can try and translate that into the arguments of, of the day, the culture, the society, that's public theology for me. Well, on what basis can the church address a secular society or people of other faiths in doing public theology, in the public square? The church does make a very big claim about what human nature is like, and it also makes a claim about God's will being for human destinies to be interdependent. There are no I without a we. And I think that means the church is, is always bound to be in conversation with unbelievers, with people of other faiths, and it doesn't seek to cement its power in that process, but just to, to set out its stall, you could say, but also to, to push its questions towards the secular society. What is the real basis of your vision of humanity? Where does it come from? How does it sustain itself? That's the kind of question you, you want to, to press. Are there pitfalls in doing public oh, th There are great pitfalls. You can find yourself talking about things where you have no particular expertise or standing to discuss. You can, you can look silly in that process. You can uh, give the impression that the church is a lot of well-meaning amateurs with ill-formed ideas. So it's very important in that process of trying to do public theology to make sure that your questions are well-formed and that you've done the conversation that enables you to ask the right questions. Could you give us a sense of what the public theology looks like on the local level, where you don't have the sort of influence of your current position? I think at the local level it happens whenever um, local churches and congregations really engage with the community around them to find what are the questions people are asking, what are the, the needs people have in common. And it seems to me that churches are very, very strongly placed to, to get a sense of the needs of a whole community, not just one sector within it, because churches ideally are, are not just interest groups. They are there on behalf of the whole human enterprise. And therefore they, they can say, our, our space, our resources are open to all of you. That's an important thing. Another thing to talk about economics, it's hard to do that without talking about globalization. How do you define that term? Globalization as it's normally used these days means that no economy in the world today is isolated from what happens in other economies. Globalization means all those are inextricably mixed together. Well, the sad thing is that uh, to talk about the global economy and globalization nine times out of 10 these days is descriptive. It simply says we are all involved in this. And what it lacks, I think very often, is a sense of the positive moral notion of a global responsibility for each other. You can say we're globally affected by each other, our destinies are shaped by each other. But then you have to go on and say, and what responsibility does that place on us all? Crucial to the Christian worldview is the notion that there's no suffering that's purely local, there's no welfare or wealth that's purely local. It's everybody's or it's nobody's. And that, I think, is part of what the image of the body of Christ in the New Testament says about the church. The community God purposes is a community in which everybody's growth is tied up with everybody else's at the moral and spiritual level. That kind of community that we see or we ought to see in the church is what God thinks the human race ought to look like. So that's what the church has a duty, I think, to argue for, present, nourish. So is it important that the church be talking about economics right now? I think it's absolutely essential for the church to be talking about economics. Not that the church has economic expertise, which will give miraculously right answers to all the problems that defeat the experts all around the world and the governments all around the world. But the church, I think, is in a perfectly good position to say, so what do you mean by growth? What do you mean by wealth? How do you understand your responsibility in this? The two things that strike me most forcibly about that, I think, are obviously the doctrine we all hold of the creation of human beings in the image of God, first of all. That tells us we are responsible. We are responsible for the effects of our choices. We're responsible in relationship. We carry the image of God, which means we have freedom, we have responsibility and initiative, but also the image of a God who is relationship. And so our responsibilities have to be exercised in that way. And that relates to the second point, which I've already hinted at. We start from the image of the body of Christ, the church in which everyone's interest, everyone's welfare is bound up with everyone else's relationship once again. 
And those two points, I think, are what the church has to bring to bear. One of the ways to marginalize a theological critique of the economy is to say, well, it's not practical, it's not this worldly. Um, how do theological concerns gain traction in the real world? Mm, interesting phrase, isn't it, the real world? And the real world at the moment, of course, is in total confusion and chaos because of um, several generations of people who describe themselves as realists and who said there is no alternative. If there really is no alternative, we are in a very, very serious position. The Christian, I think, is, is going to be saying constantly, well, actually, there is an alternative. Um, it may begin very locally. It may begin in the, the cooperative enterprise in a community, in a credit union, in a farmer's market. It may begin in very, very small ways of just showing that not everything is a zero-sum game in economics, but Okay, we're not um, proposing a new global system, but we can put our energies, put our imagination behind those local enterprises that sim simply show it can be different, really, in the real world. And I think we have every right to say to so-called realists or self-styled realists in the world, look where your realism has got us. Realism demands a proper, robust sense of what reality is, human reality and environmental reality, and we can help with that. In a recent address, you said that although people have spoken of greed as a source of our current problems, uh, you suspect it goes deeper, and you suggest that the origin of economic dysfunction and injustice is, is actually pride. Why do you say that? I was looking back to that um, early Christian tradition that sees pride as the root of all sin, and pride understood not as self-satisfaction or anything like that, but as the view that somehow my concerns, simply because they're mine, take precedence over everyone else's, I ought to be capable of running my own world. I ought not to be dependent on anyone, therefore I have to accumulate as much as I can to accumulate power over others. All of that is pride. And this accumulation of power and security in a defensive way and an acquisitive way, that's the root of greed, and that's the root of a lot of our dysfunction. Do you think that, in principle, that uh, capitalism can be consistent with, with concerns like justice? I mean, it, particularly if, if the poor aren't counted into the, a market because a market counts capital, um, are they simply left out? Can, can, they, can they be protected or can they, can they participate? The ideal is that they should participate, that they should have some, some real responsibility for shaping their lives and their possibilities. But I think what we have to do in this context is almost to rethink the whole notion of capital. We think of capital in terms of the material resources we have available to, to make profits for ourselves. Capital that is about relationship, that's about human potential, and about social cohesion. More and more people are using terms like social capital. And although it may have become a bit of a cliche, there's, there's a great deal, I think, in that. Because it reminds us that those who may not actually have purchasing power or um, leverage in a society are still human capital, if you want to use that image. They're still there as a resource, simply in their humanity. And it's on that base, I think, that we say a proper ethical global capitalism ought to be one in which everyone has that possibility, everyone has that basic recognition of dignity or power or liberty. Do, do you see more <clears throat> commonalities of needs, or do you see great differences uh, that, that might perhaps make understanding rather difficult. Obviously you can't homogenize these needs and say there's, there's a sort of one-size-fits-all response. But I think in most places that there are at least two things you can really underline as essential for any kind of change. They are investment in infrastructure, you know, safe communication, good roads, and then of course investment in education. And not least education for women, which in many um, developing or deprived countries is one of the most effective levers of change. And I've seen that in Burundi with the work the Mother's Union, the Anglican Mother's Union does there, in dealing with um, basic health care, post-trauma counseling, all of those things. Women have a, an enormously important role. That has to be underlined, I think, in many, many contexts. Do you see links then between the, uh, w the situation we're facing environmentally and ecologically and the situation we're facing economically? Somebody said, I think, that the economy is in the long run a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment. 
and it's worth remembering that. To go big again, is, is there a, a, a theological vision of what a sustainable global community would look like? Well, ideally, of course, it's called the church, but the church is so often undermined, affected by the busyness and the angriness of the society around that it doesn't always look like that. But I say that because the ideal of the church is something like this. God pours out gifts on human beings, and every gift given is given to you so that you can give it. And that means when you approach another human being, you do so, first of all, with the question, what does God want to give me through this human being? And then with the question, and what do they need from me when I meet someone from another religious tradition? I do still have to ask, and what is God giving me through these people? And what do they need from me? But it means that we approach one another with expectancy rather than with fear. I think that's morally and spiritually one of the keys. What do you believe God is saying to us in the midst of this, this crisis? I think God is saying, remember you are dust and to dust you shall return, as we say on Ash Wednesday. We're mortal, we're limited. We can't actually have risk-free, cost-free, pain-free lives. Our humanity and our human dignity depends on negotiating those risks and those costs and that pain with, with love, with imagination, intelligence, and humanity, as we usually use the word. God, God is saying, remember to be human. As you look at the churches of the Anglican Communion, how, what role do you see them playing, or do you hope for them, or places where you see them playing a positive role? I see them playing a very important role indeed in all kinds of contexts, because especially in some of the deeply deprived contexts of the African continent, what you see is churches and church-related bodies reaching communities nobody else can because they're there and they're trusted. Um, NGOs and charities will take you so far. The church has an interest, an investment, you might say, in everyone having some responsibility. I mentioned earlier the role of women in this respect. That's something the church is in Africa particularly, have contributed to enormously. And one of the things about which I think we need to be persuading government and charities rather more is that our churches are, are well worth partnering with in those contexts. Certainly in places like southern Sudan, in parts of Congo, in Burundi, in Angola, in South Africa, in other contexts like um, Southeast Asia where I've seen some extraordinary things being done, sometimes with refugee communities, the church is crucial to this. The church really does model something different. There is an alternative. A lot of our constituents are in the, the Trinity Institute, are, are parishes in the United States, so people working in different community um, uh, aspects. How do you see this playing out there on the local level? I think there's a, a straightforward pastoral task to be done, for one thing, which is and the care of those who have been most deeply damaged by financial crisis. And that may be the person who's lost their job from a bank just as much as the person who's um, at the receiving end, the bottom end of the scale, so to speak, of new financial instabilities. And the church needs, I think, them to be talking quite a lot about lifestyle, ethical and spiritual lifestyle. It needs to be persuading its people that they they ought in some important ways to be looking different. Looking different not just in some of the more conventional moral ways we, we talk about, but looking different in the way they, they assess their environmental impact, in the way they use their income, their disposable income, and the way in which they put their energies towards the building of lasting wealth or lasting welfare. As you look around at the current situation, it's also an opportunity for rebuilding, as you've alluded to. What are your hopes about what, how we may emerge from this situation? I hope we emerge with um, a deepened sense of the need for relationship in economics. Interestingly, when I talk to businessmen here, and sometimes quite senior ones, it's relationship they want to talk about. They've recognized that a lot of the economics we've relied on in the last few years has been predicated on a lack of relationship, a lack of face-to-face -face contact, a lack of awareness of interdependence, 
I hope we can draw back towards that, to, towards a situation where the risks of lending and credit are, are more related to relational assessments of people, more local, where governments have some identifiable responsibility for securing the welfare and wealth of their society so that democratically elected governments are not completely sidelined in this world of endlessly mobile capital. And above all, of course, a world in which the, the prosperous world remembers its, its debt to the not so prosperous world. The debt which we talk about of poor nations to wealthy nations or international financial institutions is for a Christian or ought for a Christian to be outweighed by the debt which in Christian terms we owe to the needy. And I just hope that we are restored to an awareness of that. Well, Archbishop, I want to thank you for taking this time to reflect on these questions and, and say how much I look forward to next January when you and your fellow panelists will really delve into them in depth. I look forward to that enormously. Thank you very much indeed.